we're sort of going full circle. We started out with the family Gobide, <laughs> the mudskippers, and now we're ending up with the family Gobide. <laughs> in this case, uh, invasive gobies in the River Rhine. And I'd like to welcome Philip Hirsch, who has done some of his studies here in Sweden. Yes, and uh, he has a very interesting title, Unauthorized Entry Prohibited. Research towards species-specific migration barriers to stop the upstream dispersal of invasive gobies. Welcome, Philip. Thank you very much, Katie. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Uh, it's really great to be here to see so many of you lovely people made it even after the coffee break, again, back in here. Uh, thank you also very much to Mikael and um, Sven and, of course, Andrea who, um, for your hospitality and for having me today. Uh, it's really a privilege to speak after so many uh, distinguished, interesting talks, and I hope I can uh, add another, uh, another perspective to this exciting topic of today. And I would start by uh, shortly introducing uh, who I mean with unauthorized. Uh, this is a sh species which I just shortly wanted to check, probably most of you are familiar with. So who of you knows this species? Just shortly raise your hand. Yes, okay. Excellent. Um, or maybe not so excellent, actually, because it's, it's an invasive species that is... Uh, making a lot of problems, but it's good that you are so familiar with it uh, because this is going to be the main target species, so to speak, of our talk. So it's uh, the round goby that is invasive. Um, uh, it occurs at very high densities um, and um, it is a very voracious uh, predator and it feeds on uh, the, the eggs and also the larvae of native fish species, so it's, it's a problem for the reproduction of a lot of native species. And it has been spread all throughout the world, actually, on both sides of the Atlantic in temperate waters. The invasion of the round goby is ongoing, and it probably has been brought here to Sweden and to other water systems all across Europe uh, by larger ships that take up ballast water, and with these ballast water they take up also the larvae of these gobies, which are partly pelagic right after hatching, and so the larger main channels are sort of inoculated with this passive dispersal by the large ships. And this has been going on for a couple of years, um, but now we're in a situation that after this assisted passive dispersal in the main channels, we now see an active dispersal of this invasive fish into tributaries where a lot of native, very valuable species um, occur. And uh, the, the, valuability, uh, the value and the, um, the relevance of the, uh, the danger of the round goby for these native species, I would like to exemplify by introducing another uh, a native species to you that occurs in Switzerland and is a very iconic species there. It's the common nase. Uh, it's called, because it has this very peculiar nase, uh, this very peculiar nose there. Um, it's uh, called nasling in uh, Swedish. It's in Switzerland, it's red listed and it's really a flagship species. Um, it conducts iconic migrations, very spectacular to see, maybe comparable to the asp that you see also uh, around here in this area of Sweden. Um, it's big, large individuals that conduct very large spawning runs, and then you can actually see how they spawn in these shallow um, river sections of the tributaries of major rivers um, on gravel, and, and clean gravel and pebbles. So to um, facilitate um, the migrations of the migratory species with the common nays just being the flagship species, um, there has been huge, a uh, huge investment into a lot of conservation projects, especially fish ladders, to facilitate, to rebuild the connectivity of our rivers to bring back these iconic big species. And you see it uh, here at the very right uh, bottom. I would like to give you a, a very detailed in insight into the situation 
of the High Rhine where we work. So here there you see Basel, that's the university um, where I come from. And here you see in, in yellow, so it's a very complicated picture, but it tells a lot. So I will just uh, so bear with me on that one and I will walk you through it step by step. So here there is the invasion um, of the round Gobi as far as it, is ha it has come. It was probably brought here by shipping. However, shipping only goes until here. Then there are a lot of larger hydropower dams that continue also further up the High Rhine, and then you also have hydropower here in the tributaries. And in that tributaries here indicated in red, we have been seeing over the past couple of years after uh, the population density has increased quite drastically here in the main channel, now the round Gobi start to migrate into these tributaries. And within these tributaries, we actually do have these spawning areas of these very important sought after iconic species. Uh, the common nays we studied particularly because this was a, a spawning area deemed to be of a priority national interest, um, which we surveyed, um, which has been restored. There were a couple of weirs that have been rebuilt to allow the nays to migrate up there. Round Gobi had already entered and we analyzed the round Gobi stomachs uh, using DNA tests and we actually unfortunately could confirm that the round goby are actually consuming the eggs of the of the nice here and to to um to exemplify the 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 scale of the investment of what in cent what's been done in central europe um to bring back the the migration corridors and to facilitate migration um here you see the these dots that stand representative for projects and the financial volume of projects that are meant mostly um, these are uh, new fish ladders or the removal of existing barriers or the revitalization of spawning habitats and all these um, um, these conservation projects are meant to remove barriers and to give you an indication of why I think uh, this, um, this removal of these barriers is, is creating this field of conflict, I would now like to ask you to follow me underwater into this tributary that we have been heavily studying, where the round goby have not yet reached the NASA spawning grounds. And um, we put, just this summer, we put down a GoPro and um, so here we also had a measuring. This is the tributary the right where the bridge was. Here you can see that's the main channel. Now we go underwater. We had a measuring stick here. I just cut through the next minute until it was clear again. Then we moved the stick. And what you see here, this is what's going on below the water surface in Swiss tributaries in the High Rhine. See, there's one. Here's one. There, there, here. There's one. There's also one in the back here. There's one, and we didn't, this is just uh, any regular area of the river. Uh, and I chose this video because uh, this video films um, uh, the, um, a substrate onto which most of these iconic migratory species also spawn, right? So here, that was probably a, a bird or something flying over. But they are, they're only scared for a little while, right? Then they return back. But I show you this so that you get an indication of if there is a, a trout or a grayling or, an, or a common ice for that matter. Spawning here, um, it would release the eggs more or less just into the goby's mouths and they would start to feed on them. So in this, in this situation, uh, we came to the research question of can we then stop this active dispersal by maybe uh, creating a species-specific barrier once we're investing so much into rebuilding existing barriers? Can we create a species-specific barrier that would stop the invasion of the round goby while at the same time uh, not creating a migration barrier for native species? And the approach that we took was that 
Um, since there is so much going on, so much engineering work, so much rebuilding work going on, our approach was that we thought, okay, once we have the chance of all these constructions going on, uh, we might use the existing, then still existing migration bottleneck, for example, around a hydropower plant and uh, rebuild these fish passages with this species specific barrier in a way that the uh, round Gobi would be stopped in its further upstream dispersal into these tributaries. And the idea to do that um, actually is, is nothing new. Um, it is uh, one very successful example is our crayfish barriers. They are used a lot all, um, all throughout uh, temperate ecosystems, but also in Switzerland. Uh, that's just one example here in Switzerland. Uh, signal crayfish is also invasive, just as it is in Sweden, unfortunately, also. And there has been designs of a barrier that is basically uh, preventing and trapping the fish, uh, the, the crayfish here down below. And then it gets, uh, there's a lot of maintenance needed for that barrier because you have to basically go there and take out the fish. But the, the nice side effect is that you can actually sell the crayfish then, or depending on, uh, if you're a master's student, you're also allowed to eat them if you work at our <laughs> department. So, but of course, it's a, lo it's a very laborious work, right? Um, but and the, the idea here was this is just fish ver versus crayfish. So the idea was here that native fish would be able to migrate up here, but it was not separating between an invasive crayfish and a native crayfish. And of course, the swimming performance um, of a crayfish cannot be matched with that of a fish. So in that sense, um, it's a different situation. But we still were inspired by these existing approaches. Um, but we wanted to do it for the round goby. And I should mention here, um, I, I would really like to emphasize this, that when we talk about species-specific migration barriers, it's only between the slow swimming, bottom living, small benthic species that are basically ecologically comparable to the round goby. So uh, we can build pretty effective barriers. And if you have a, a trout of 50 something centimeters, they would just easily just jump over any barrier and you would have the round goby stopped but still have the big iconic native species moving up there. But of course we cannot do this. We have to make sure that even the valuable, <coughs> there are non-iconic, but still valuable small bottom living species that also need migration, also perform migrations that we want to still allow and not block, right? So our approach was to compare the swimming performance of round goby with two, um, relevant, I should say, or I would like to see them as relevant native species, that's the gudgeon. Um, in Swedish it's called the sandkryper and uh, the bullhead, um, the cortus gobio, um, the stean simpa. Um, these two species are, uh, are not uncommon, but they have very high requirements concerning the habitat quality, and they actually are very severely affected by habitat fragmentation. So this is why we chose these two species, because they, they are uh, bottom living, especially the Stean Simpas, ecologically very similar to the round goby. But um, they do require, or they, they, um, the future um, of our rivers should look like they are free to migrate and that their migrations that dispersal is actually improved rather than impaired. But in any case, our first step was to see if there even was some, some first indication, some possibility um, of differences between these ecologically very similar species. And we did that um, with uh, some very traditional hands-on experimental work in a swim canal. Uh, we measured the sprint swimming speed um, this is just an off-the-shelf swim canal. You can actually buy this exactly as it looks like here. 
um, we put the fish in all these three species, we put them in the chamber, let, had them acclimatized for uh, some minutes, and then we're, we were basically ramping up the flow velocities to make sure um, that we don't really fatigue them. It was not about prolonged swimming, but it was about the ability of the species to make quick bursts, as they have to do when they pass some migration bottleneck in a fish ladder, for example. And then, of course, we terminated um, the experiment as soon as the fish weren't inclined to swim anymore. Um, and here is just a, um, a short idea of how it looks like. Um, it was really fitting that we had Anna's talk and, uh, and her explanations about the hydrodynamics between uh, what's going on in fish swimming. And you can imagine that if a fish is a bottom living fish that has no swim bladder, then the hydrodynamics, I suppose, is even more challenging around that fish to comprehend and to measure because we have like a, an extra dimension here with the contact to the bottom. But you see here, it's around Gobi, um, still making an effort to hold its position and, um, and sprinting, right? So this is, was an experimental, uh, set, uh, the experimental setup was designed so that we, we can call this a sprint when it is still moving against the flow and actually making centimeters above ground across certain centimeters. Um, for the gudgeon, um, you also, well, I, I don't want to take away too much, but maybe you notice already some differences in the way the gudgeon is swimming here as compared to how the round goby is swimming. Um, and then also the species morphologically most similar to the round goby again, that's the bullhead. And you see here, um, still able to, s to move against the current. And then the flow velocity that we can very, very exact, uh, me measure very accurately in the swim chamber, then we c uh, is interpreted as the sprint speed, so the speed against which the fish, uh, the flow velocity against the fish can still move. And um, to our surprise and um, uh, um, to my great joy, actually, because if, we ha if the data had looked different, then we could have, had, we could have buried that uh, research project right from the get-go. But it looked as it looked. And to us, this was uh, an interesting insight. So there is a huge variation in how the gobies swim. Um, it's not too many individuals. We had some limitations there. Um, but still, on average, um, there, there seemed to be a difference in, in the sprinting abilities. And the gudgeon was clearly the fastest sprinter. And there are some individuals that made really uh, fast sprints. But overall, the round goby seemed to show not as much of a sprinting performance as the other species showed. However, this was, of course, um, only very preliminary data, but it was enough for us to engage in a cooperation with uh, hyd hydraulic engineers, with people that do very elaborate, very colorful, mathematically uh, high-level uh, modeling that is too much for a feeble-minded ecologist like I am. So I'm happy to say that I don't understand exactly what they're doing, and I'm not showing you what they're doing, actually. So. But eventually, uh, to cut a long and complicated story short, we came up with what we thought could be, um, could be a species-specific barrier for the species that we have been dealing with so far. And um, so we took these differences and they were used. We, uh, we cooperatively with these hydraul hydraulic engineers from Karlsruhe designed this barrier with the idea that we, we could create a slippery slope on which the flow would be um, higher than it would be in a regular fish pass. So this here, you see that's a slot in a, in a fish pass, like this regular European standard vertical slot uh, fish pass. And then we could uh, insert this barrier into this fish pass, and then we would create a higher flow velocity and a more slippery slope than this vertical slot would uh, would have without this barrier. 
so the idea was then uh, once we had this created in the in the computer we could actually build this into a large into a life size model and do some really cool hands on uh, research with fish again. So we tested that barrier in exactly such a vertical slot um, which we rebuilt um, in that facility in Karlsruhe and then we, leased, we released individuals downstream here so this was the vertical slot fish pass which was built and designed in the way that if you were to build or to redesign an existing older fish pass somewhere from the 80s or so you would do it according, this would be like the state of the art fish pass basically. Um, then we released individuals here, we had some cameras to record what they were doing when they were passing through the regular slot as opposed to when they were trying to pass, we were hoping so at least through the barrier prototype and we tested at two different flow conditions, one with very uh, unrealistic I should say uh, slower flow um, just to make sure that we even see movements of these species through all these compartments and one with realistic flow conditions that you would have in a fish pass in the high Rhine or its tributaries. And then we, we could basically monitor the dispersal of the fish from one compartment into the other here. And so this is what you see if you then hopefully in some years from now you will read an article from us um, but since uh, we're a, f uh, a small and familiar group here, I can show you how it really looked. Um, this, is, uh, this is actually this giant experimental facility where we had the possibility to build this. This was this gutter. Here you see the first regular slot as it would be in reality if we were to uh, build a new fish pass. Here you see the barrier also with the cameras above and this is here where the water comes in and this is basically here this is to it unifies the flow and it creates exactly the flow that you would have in reality as well this is where we kept the fish we had them in the same type of water we had a very constant high flow through circulation so they would that they would be very well adapted to what they would meet in here and then this is a colleague of mine um, who is in, who's just releasing these individuals in that compartment, uh, waiting and hoping for them to then uh, migrate upstream. And so first we looked at the very low flow rate and of course we were happy to see that without giving them any cue for migrating up, so we didn't like train them or we didn't introduce any, any food for them, um, there was a very strong inclination to disperse upstream. Um, this was actually strongest in round Gobi, so more than half of the individuals we put in here migrated through that first slot. Um, a bit less in proportion of the Gutchen and the Bullhead migrated into this uh, first, through that first slot into the first basin, but now of course we're really interested what's happening. Do they migrate further? Do they disperse also across the barrier? and still very low flow velocities. You see still most of uh, the fish that migrated through the barrier most was the round goby, but it was a much smaller proportion took the barrier than actually took the first slot. Okay, but still all of them made it. Um, so the next step was again um, to ramp this up to higher flows and to give you a short idea of how it looks like when, uh, when this fish is, is trying. This is a bullhead and you see it was very quick and you see how, how quick they swim and how much of an effort they have to have to put in um, even at the lower flow velocities you see really that they cannot uh, you know they cannot do so um, they cannot swim in a, in a way that they could in that swim chamber so this is really a more realistic setting they really have to go all in to make it to the barrier but they actually did now, how did it look like at the highest flow rate? Well, to our, uh, well, actually, the good news was that they all still tried to migrate up through that slot into the first compartment. Um, still, gobies were most inclined to migrate up there, um, but still, uh, more, say, roughly one, one fourth and a bit less of the bullhead also uh, went through that first slot. Um, 
So, but now we are talking real flow velocities, okay? Now we're talking um, a, a regular riv river that has earned its name, and the barrier is working uh, far too good because the barrier is um, blocking the round goby, but it is also blocking the bullhead. Um, and these are flow velocities that, if you remember the sprint speeds that I showed you before, this is basically the top level that the gudgeon reached and that also the round goby har kind of reached, but that was f apparently too far out of reach of the bullhead. And um, this basically meant for us um, that uh, only those species that have the physiological and morphological capability to have this high perform swimming mode do actually make it up the barrier. And we assume that because we also checked whether the bullhead would even try. Um, interestingly, the round goby did not try that barrier here under the fast flow conditions. So although they seemed most inclined to migrate or to disperse, or you could also say to explore new territory, um, they didn't try that barrier. The bullhead, however, tried, and I will split the, I will split the top view of this barrier now. I will split in two so that it's easier to see because they're swimming so fast now and it's, it's so high, f high flow in that next slide. So that's a video of a bullhead trying to make it up. So you see, that guy really, really <laughs> makes an effort to get in. See, there, there it is. See a lot of air bubbles. But then it says, like, OK, I'm keeping the position, recovering for a while, then going all in, but not quite making it. And uh, we, I would have wished this was a round goby, <laughs> but it actually was a bullhead. And the bullhead really, we can say, really tried. There were several attempts, but none of them made it. And uh, since we all like winners, um, I, of course, also like to show you um, how the gudgeon performed. Um, this is another GoPro we had in there because they were swimming so fast you could hardly see it. But there's one individual separating from the main group, then making it, then doing this weird whirling turn. Here you zoom in again, here it separates, it approaches. <laughs> and you see that? Y you s <laughs> You see, it's really like it's whirling around, but still swimming full speed ahead, really uh, giving it its all to make it through that barrier. OK, so um, I, the, the good, probably the best news about this setup was that all fish were actually willing to disperse upstream. And this was important because we didn't want to create an art and a, an, a test of a dispersal in which the fish weren't really motivated or inclined to disperse in the first place. But they actually were. Um, interestingly, the round goby seemed to show had the highest percentage of individuals wanting uh, to disperse upstream in the low flow environments and in the non-barrier slots where the round goby. Now, at the high velocities, we found that the uh, gudgeon could pass, but we found that the round goby does not pass, but um, we tested three species. So um, that one species that is also very important uh, does not pass, but it, at least it attempts to pass, whereas the round goby did not. OK, so where, where, do we, where, do go from, where do we go from here? Well, the thing is, there are some caveats, of course, to, to, this, uh, to this experiment. Um, uh, it, it's, a, it's a lot of work to do these kind of experiments. And the, we did not test the native species. And I, I, I know that um, many people would think that would be important. But the thing is that just by there's so much literature about this vertical slot, and it has been designed in such an elaborate uh, engineering uh, knowledgeable way that we can really certainly say that these migratory species would have no problems migrating up that slot and also that barrier, just because we have such a good hydraulic understanding of the barrier. Um, of course, we only had this selection of these two native low performing species. Uh, we couldn't, there are much more, of course. We chose these two because they seem to be the most relevant for our specific system, but they might absolutely not be the most relevant, for example, for a Swedish 
system. Um, we had a rather small sample size. Um, yeah, well, um, there's no data like more data, so it's always better to have more species, but there are limits to everything. This was a rather short experimental period. It was only two hours. Interestingly, most of the attempts and the movements were happening in the first hour, so it really seemed to work that if you put them in, they want to migrate. Either they want they they have this oh uh, now I'm free feeling. Um, um, at any case, there seemed to be a strong motivation to mo move fast and early, and we couldn't have it ru running for longer because what I didn't know is that if uh, it's a closed system, that fish ladder. And um, due to this high flow velocity and the potential energy of the water when it's flowing downstream is transformed into thermic energy and then the water heats up very quickly. I didn't know that, but apparently it's the friction, it's, physio it's the physical processes. So if we wanted to keep the temperature constant, we had to stop this after two or a maximum three hours. This is also why we had to do it in spring, because then later the, that huge water tank that was supplying this facility had, uh, had warmed up, and then uh, we would have run into even more temperature problems. Uh, then eventually, of course, there's clearly a field test needed of such a barrier, marking a lot of individuals, and then testing what's going on actually in the field. But above these experimental considerations, um, I, I was hoping that today I could um, spare the last couple of minutes to uh, go, go through a couple of trade-offs that are inherently connected to the idea of species-specific barriers. And I would like you to um, of hopefully, of course, later on also raise your voice and discuss. But um, especially I would like you to cast your vote. So while I'm going through a couple of trade-offs, I will later on at the end of this session now in 10 minutes or so, I will ask you to uh, use your mobile phones to make an online vote. So if you have your mobile phones with you um, and you're connected to the internet, um, the name was not too historic, wasn't it? Or what is the name of the uh, Wi-Fi again? Well, you, you have Eduroam also here, or you maybe you don't even Wi-Fi, don't even need Wi-Fi, but uh, you just have to go online onto a website, which I'm soon going to show you, and then you can click on the different options. Um, sorry, Casey, I, th I think it's a not too historic guy was. Okay, great, thank you. Sorry, Casey. Um, Atten so, uh, but first I will introduce you to a couple of trade-offs that I identified. Maybe there are more, but these ones seemed um, most obvious to me. Well, I mean, the, if, we, if we go back to this initial situation that we were discussing, um, uh, you could say like, okay, um, invasive species are a problem, but nature finds its way, it's a natural process. Um, we're investing so much into rebuilding uh, the connectivity, all we just stay at our um, major goal that migration of all native fish must remain unaffected. So even the slightest negative effect of, for example, as we have shown, the percentage of individuals trying the ascent or making the ascent being diminished, this is unacceptable. Um, this could be one position, one very logical position. Um, Another position could be what I also sometimes encounter when I discuss with people outside about uh, the invasion of round goby and invasive species in general. There is a sentiment which I very much understand and I also feel, but I don't know why. I don't have really em empirical, uh, em empirical reliance here. But there is this sentiment that we can buy time, right? So if we slow down invasions, then the native communities might have the chance to better adapt, and then eventually the impacts will not be as severe. So this would mean that we do affect the migration to some extent, but we also decrease the likelihood of a further invasion, maybe to the same or to a comparable extent that we actually affect the migration of the native species. Um, then then you could also say like, okay, I'm willing to accept that native species are impaired, 
it's you know I have you have to make compromises but then I want you to guarantee me that there is not going never going to be around Gobi crossing that barrier that's that's a fair um, position to have because you say like okay I'm I'm compromising some of my conservation goals but I want to I want that compromise to deliver me a full certainty of that these invasions can really be prevented. And this basically corresponds to this 100% species specificity. Then, um, finally, um, another um, trade-off would be, which is also pretty logical, so I'm, 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 I hope I don't introduce any, introduce any prior bias here, I think all these are really absolutely fair and logic, you could say like, okay, I just want to completely stop all migrations because that's the safest bet. And then I pay a couple of uh, talented and uh, motivated young researchers to go out in the field, identify the fish that have accumulated behind this 100% effective barrier and transport them over that barrier and release them. That's actually not so rare. It's done at a couple of major hydropower dams. This is actually practiced. And um, if you consider the argument of costs being, uh, being a showstopper here, um, I just want you to remind, to, remind uh, to remember the high cost of these investments into the migration habitats. So you could fund a whole army of biologists for decades doing this catch and sort. And you wouldn't even be close to the investments that you're doing into restoring these spawning habitats. So, after having introduced these, maybe there are, are, are more, then I'm happy to, to hear from you. Um, I have structured these as A, B, C, D, and I would li now like to ask you to go through that website. It's, uh, it's a tool called Poll Everywhere. And when you have reached that website, then um, you are asked to uh, um, type in the session code, so to speak, of this poll that I'm, uh, I want to do with you now. And you can also use, um, this is not working so well, but it's also an alternative if you can't go online. You can also test text. This, this is P-H-I-L-L-I-P-H-I-R-S-C, uh, then 299, if you have come to that homepage. And then you should see um, basically this here that you would then be able to poll. These are the results. Yeah, and I, I would try to leave this uncommented. I think it's really exciting. I thank you very much. Uh, that was all of my time. Uh, thank you for voting. Uh, and thank you for your attention. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Philip. And uh, t speaking of the invasive round goby, we have it in uh, our waters too. In the last 10 years, it's uh, spread. It, you find it all the way from Gothenburg to north of Stockholm, all the way up to Uppland. And uh, the worrying thing is that it might find its way into Lake Merladen. So perhaps we need a species-specific barrier to stop it getting into Lake Merladen. So any ideas are very welcome.